basically saying under fair and reasonable terms, which is really basically when you boil it down, uh, the manufacturers get to determine what that is. Uh, firmware, as I mentioned before, independent server, uh, service provider is a person that's engaged in the diagnostic maintenance or repair. This is somebody who fixes stuff, fixes stuff when it breaks. Um, and uh, locked, uh, we're going to talk about uh, this a little bit in depth, uh, but it's basically a password that uh, a manufacturer might set to make sure that components are talking to each other at that firmware level I was talking about earlier. Motor vehicles are defined uh, specifically, and the reason, and there's an exception in the bill for motor vehicles because motor vehicles are uh, governed by a memo of understanding. You, today, you have a right to repair for vehicles and uh, for, for motor vehicles specifically. So uh, that came out of an effort out of Massachusetts. I'll be happy to get into the weeds and talk to you about why that came about if you'd like. But for the, for the time being, um, what I'd like for you to understand is that we're trying to treat virtually everything else like we, we're treating automobiles today because you have a right to repair your car if it breaks today. The original equipment manufacturer, the people who, who um, uh, build the products that we're talking about, Owner is the individual who purchases that, that equipment. Parts are the replacement parts. Uh, person has the traditional meaning that we usually mean. Trade secrets will have the same meaning as provided. Um, we're not asking for trade secrets. Again, that's one of the claims you'll hear today. We're not asking for trade secrets. Again, we're, uh, we're asking for the ability to diagnose, maintain, and repair, those three things only. And unlocking materials are part of that, those password things I was talking about a, um, a second ago. We get into the heart of the bill on line 78. Original equipment manufacturers should make available to any independent service provider or owner of the digital electronic equipment any necessary service materials for fair and reasonable terms. It means if you have, if you have these materials available for sale, I would like to be able to buy them at a price that you set. Uh, violation of the article is, a, is a, this is the part where we have teeth, is would be constituted under the unfair or deceptive practice in consumer transactions along with the Fair Business Practices Act of 75. Turning the page, uh, nothing in this article should be construed to require an original equipment manufacturer to divulge a trade secret. Uh, that's a, I think that's important to virtually everybody here. We're not asking for trade secrets to be transferred. We're talking, again, maintenance, diagnosis, and repair. Uh, no provision of this article should be construed to alter terms of any arrangement in force between an authorized pr repair provider and original equipment manufacturer, including but not limited to the performance provision of a warranty or recall of repair work. Um, so we're, we're, we're not messing with warranties. Nothing in this article should be required uh, the original equipment manufacturer and authorized pr repair provider to provide an owner and independent service provider access to information other than documentation, which is defined or is one of those manuals. That, uh, that otherwise provided by the original equipment manufacturer to an authorized service provider. So that's essentially what the bill does. It gives a property owner uh, access to the tools that are necessary to do those three things, maintenance, diagnosis, repair, maintenance, replacing tires, spark plug fluids, uh, things that keep your equipment running, Diagnos diagnostics, tools that I would purchase from you to help me figure out what's broken on my equipment. And lastly, repair. There's, there's something broken, there's a component that needs to be replaced. Those three things are the only thing, three things that we're dealing with here. Uh, and, and I'll give you a, from my background. Once upon a time, I fixed things that were broken. I don't do that anymore, I haven't for several years now. Uh, but I used to work in large enterprise data centers, which some of you uh, realize and know. Uh, I had a client that had five uh, identical servers, or servers are computers in my world, bigger, larger computers than you would see at home or even on a laptop. Five identical pieces of equipment. The processor, CPU, went out in one of them. And I had, the customer had, had decommissioned four of them. And so he had four basic spares that he could use for any point in time. I, and his production server was, was working just fine. Well, he had cannibalized and parted out and sold parts of these things. So none of these were actually in working condition, but it did have a CPU in one of these five servers that I could take out of that server and put it into their existing production server that was up and running with their, their full-blown production database. So I, I went to use that, that part and put it into this. Now, these are, these are all pieces of equipment that are five or years or older and have been paid for with their own money. They own them. 
and the CPU would not work in this computer unless I called the original equipment manufacturer and the, the warranty had been expired for three years. And they told me that in order for me to get the password to unlock and make that CPU work, I'd have to pay them for three years of, of service maintenance agreement from the day of the, the warranty expiration. Um, and this is something that the customer actually owned. And they were not able to actually fix their own thing unless they, they, they paid the original equipment manufacturer an exorbitant fee for, some, for a service that they never actually used. Uh, and it was wrong then, and it's wrong now. And that's, that was my personal eye-opening experience with this uh, several years ago. Again, I don't do that business anymore. and haven't been in it for several years. So, but I did want to share that as a personal story. <clears throat> and then um, I, f for uh, a lot of you, I'm going to save you the, the pain and misery of, of reading through the materials that we've given you. But I, I understand and recognize that everybody on this committee has been given, uh, sent emails with information that I will categorize as misinformation about what the Right to Repair Act does. If you read through uh, every one of these, these uh, pieces of paper that uh, you were given today, if you haven't, we'll make sure, if you haven't gotten one yet, I have stack here. But it goes through point by point. You're going to hear from CompTIA, and they sent an email, and they talk about proprietary and uh, IP. We refute that point by point. You're going you're gonna to hear from, you got an email from Alec. We, we respond to that point by point in, in the documentation. You got an email from uh, Americans for Tax Reform. We respond to that point by point. Every single point that you read in there gets, gets refuted at one point or another in the document, documentation that we provide for you today. We wanted to make sure you had that so you can make an informed decision and have all the information in, in front of you. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to answer questions. That's what the bill does, and that's, what the, that's the goal. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Any questions for the author of the bill? Chairman Watts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Scott, yeah, I, we've had several conversations about it, and I appreciate you talking to me about this bill. And just a couple of things uh, I just want to, I guess, get clarification on. I, you know, I know you're a, you're a man of less government, uh, so why aren't, why aren't we getting involved in, in telling private industry what they can and can't do? Sure. Uh, as, the, as the first question, I Sure. Guess. I, I believe there's a fundamental role for government in protecting the individual rights of, of every person, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've established government. In this particular case, I believe it's perfectly acceptable for the government to help a person protect their property. And, this, and, and when we start talking about right to repair, I think it's a fundamental property rights issue. And so, yeah, I'm, on all, I'm all for less government, but I'm also for protecting the, the right of the individual, uh, and that's what I believe this bill does. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. I know you mentioned computers that you own, and uh, I own lots of, or I, I lease lots of tractors, and I call them my own, and I treat them like they're my own, um, and they cost a good bit more than a, than a uh, computer do, or does, excuse me. But what's what's the the liability going to be on that if if I'm tampering with that equipment or I do something or pay somebody that hadn't had the training to to do something modified or diagnose it? Um, what's the recourse going to be there? If, if the same as the it would be today, if uh, if you had a if you uh, decide to uh, modify your car by putting different muffler on it, or uh, you decide to change the air filter, you're modifying your car. It's the same thing. The, the manufacturer is not going to be on the hook for that and, and, uh, in those cases, and they wouldn't be in this either. And you know, I, I know you mentioned lease just very briefly, and I want to point out that this does not include lease equipment, equipment based upon the conversation that you and I had. We took mm -hmm. leases out. So it, it's just for equipment that you purchase and own. Okay, so if I purchase and own it, um, and I make changes to that piece of equipment without the manufacturer's knowledge, mm -hmm. There, there, there's nothing today that would change. There would, there would be no liability on the, the manufacturer's not going to void the warranty or make me buy. Oh, they could void the warranty. Cotton bigger. No, they, they could void the warranty on you, but that would be a decision that you would make as an individual. Okay, one more, Mister. So I've been told that the, as far as equipment goes, that manufacturers are by the year 2021 will have pretty much everything available. Well, that's some. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about everything here. The, 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 the manufacturers that you're talking about are, are specific to, I believe, agriculture. Would that be correct? 
That is correct. Right. We're talking about everything. We're talking about everything from your cell phone to your computer, your laptop, to an enterprise data center computer, to a switch, to anything that has a digital component to it. You would be able to, so, so I would, while I'm, I'm very happy to hear that those in the agriculture community are doing that, that's not what's happening in, in other industries. Further, uh, Chairman Watson, if I might, I, I would if, if you think that that's a good policy, I would ask you to support this bill so that we could get equal access on, in other industries as we would uh, the, to what the uh, folks in the ag industry are doing. repair a cell phone or a computer and the right to repair a, a heavy expensive piece of equipment that is you know lots of money not you know well I, I would I've worked on computers uh, for example when I worked at Hewlett Packard a Superdome the most expensive uh, computer I ever worked on was 1.9 million dollars um, and I require it required me to be on site within four hours with part in hand to uh, assess the repair so I, I, I get it um, but uh, I would I would tend to disagree that just because it's expensive uh, that you don't have a right to repair it if it's if it's broken. But what would have happened if you'd have messed up on that 1.9 million computer? Who well, would have paid for it? I, I actually did at one time, <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to tell you that story. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I actually did one point, and uh, the and you know what we ended up paying for it. Um, it was and it was an expensive mistake, but. Um, the, the, that's the truth, but the, it doesn't mean that the owner of that equipment, my customer in that point, shouldn't have been allowed to hire me if they didn't want to. Mr. Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Turner, I, I'm, I find myself kind of all over the place on this bill. When I look at parts of it, I think, okay, well, that makes sense. I look at parts of it that I don't like yet, and, and you know, the uh, – would it not make more sense um, to, to have somehow where the it's actually as you purchase a product, the owner would be given this information or passcodes or keys as part of the purchase or even part of the marketing plan where if you've got one cell phone that will give you the stuff and one won't, I know which one I'm buying. It, it yeah. just doesn't seem like, I mean, are, are we using a sledgehammer to drive a little nail here? Uh, I. Well, I mean, uh, with all due respect to, to that particular analogy, I, I disagree with that. But the, if you look at some of the equipment or some of the uh, documentation that we've sent to you, uh, one of the things I want to point out is under antitrust laws, OEMs are not allowed to monopolize repair by demanding customers buy their repair services. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and that's known as an illegal tying agreement. So, they're, so we can't actually do it that way. The best way would be to allow a, a private property owner to have access to information if they wish to purchase it. I believe that that is that honors the nature of the free market that I think you and I would both agree that we want to try to preserve. Mm -hmm. But we cannot force a company to do it. We can only say if they if they are engaged in the act of trade that they would sell it to anybody who wants it if they want to. Does that make sense? Am I am I? So, for example. If you have a diagnostic tool for my mug, just and, there, and this was a digital device, and you were the manufacturer of this mug, and something was wrong, and I and I couldn't figure out what it was myself, and I called you up, and I said, "Do you do you sell a diagnostic tool?" And you say, "Yes, I do. It's forty nine ninety nine." That I would then give you forty nine ninety nine, and I would take the tool and I would try to figure out what's wrong with my mug. That is honoring the free market because there's a couple things that are important there. You established the price. We negotiated that. I agreed to the terms with you and said, I'll give you that money for, for, for that tool. Now, under this bill, if you said, we're not going to sell that to anybody, then I don't have access to it. But if you sell it to somebody, you got to sell it to me. As the owner. As an owner, as a property owner, yes, sir. All right. Um when, when I guess I'm struggling with the part in your bill, especially um, where is it? wrong page. Excuse me. On line 79, uh, that's section A. All right, is this not an overreach where we are now dictating to 
companies what they have to do and who they have to sell it to. I mean, this is, I mean, that's probably the biggest struggle I have in this is that so, one section there. Okay. But at the same time, you know, if you, if I, you know, I use, if you use the, the definition of extortion, when you're forced to, to do something, it's, you, you could almost say, well, these companies are extorting this from the customer. So it's, it's kind of this weird balancing act. I'm trying to figure out where we ought to be on this. So that's, that I think is um, one of the reasons why it took me a long time to get get this bill to a point where I wanted to introduce it, Representative Kirby, um, because I, I, I tend to agree with the initial um, with initial concerns of are we force are we are we forcing somebody to do something? A, and here's the reality. The the equip, original equipment manufacturer, whether it's a tractor in the field that breaks down and it's and it's immobilized by locking a password, in order to get that working again, that farmer has to call up that manufacturer and get that password. And they're going to end up paying a fee, and they're over the barrel at that point. And so they're not allowed to fix their own equipment. They have an immobilized piece of equipment that they've paid. You know, uh, Chairman Watson says, you know, a lot of money for. And, and now they're over the barrel. And so what is the appropriate role of government in that particular case? And I, I believe it is to protect the individual and their right to the property that they purchased. Um, they should never be in a situation where it is essentially extortion to require them to pay an exorbitant fee to get a, a password to, un to unlock uh, a, a mode that allowed them to repair or maintain or diagnose their own equipment. And so as things get more and more digital, as everything from your toaster to your refrigerator to uh, your washer and dryer, uh, as things get more and more digital, you're going to need to have the opportunity to fix things when they break. Um, and one of the things you might hear today is uh, we're, we're going to talk about safety uh, a little bit, I believe. You know, my wife is one of the least techno uh, t uh, technically inclined individuals you'll ever meet. But uh, our very expensive dryer um, pr uh, went on the fritz. The heating element failed. She went online. She watched some videos. She said, I think I can do that. She bought a part from uh, uh, some repair shop in Canada, uh, had it shipped here, and watching the video, she took that entire dryer apart and replaced that thing. Uh, that's a digital piece of equipment. Uh, if, if there had been a password on it, we would have had to call the manufacturer, much like farmers do today when they're in the field and their tractor breaks, and get, a, get them to give us a password, even though we did all the work, we were perfectly safe in doing so. Uh, we took all the precautions that were, were recommended and we were able to effect the repair without having to, to pay an exorbitant fee. Um, so I think that's, you know, I understand the, the, the initial concern, but if we don't tackle this now, we're going to in a few years because every consumer everywhere is gonna be doing two things. They're gonna be screaming at us to change the law or they're gonna be throwing away their, their stuff because they're not going to be able to, to fix it. What, one last question. Absolutely. Do you, do you think there's a possibility that we put our citizens in, in a difficult situation or a bad situation where, I don't know, and I'm not picking on Apple, but we'll just say Apple decides, okay, we're not going to sell the latest and greatest to, in Georgia. We're going to sell the old stuff because we've got to make access to it. So here's the deal. Uh, it, the first state that breaks ground on this is going to set policy nationwide. And uh, the example of that is the memo of understanding that happens with automobiles because Massachusetts broke ground on automobiles. So uh, because of the Commerce Clause, they won't have that opportunity because if we allow that to happen here, then every other state is going to leverage the fact that George is able to do it. So we are going to be leading the the charge on this or we're going to benefit it from it when another state does it. Chairman Watson. Thank you. Yeah, well, he just kind of answered my question and that was uh, who, if any other states were doing this uh, and you kind of just answered it, so that was all. But there, I assume there's none currently. No, no there's several efforts around the state to, to get it done. Uh, right now, uh, I'm aware of several states. I don't know which ones. I don't want to give you a number or, or because it's kind of changing all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just got in the, in the fray a couple of weeks ago when I dropped this bill. But uh, there's also national uh, federal legislation that uh, is being debated as well. Any other questions from committee members? 
I guess my my concern is and my question, and we've talked a little bit about it, and Chairman Watson and I have also spoken about it, and in terms of diagnosing equipment, and, and I'm more familiar with, with agriculture equipment, obviously, but from, from uh, some of the other uh, devices that you've named, you know, we've ordered parts and fixed them ourselves. What's prohibiting? Is it the actual computing part of it that that is really the 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 focus of where we're trying to get to? Yeah, not every manufacturer is is engaging in these types of, of behaviors, uh, but the, for the ones who are, it's removing the right to repair from the person who purchased it. So you mentioned that you're able to fix your own phone. Uh, that's great. Not every manufacturer is going to be doing that moving forward. Um, the the biggest the biggest uh, offender that we see is when somebody uses a passcode when you use when you try to replace a part and the firmware locks the device and prevents you from using it. So if you replace a, a screen on a phone and you didn't use the a, a part, you didn't have the passcode, then it would lock up your phone. And you wouldn't be able to use it at all. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, we do have a list that, uh, of individuals who have signed up to, uh, to speak uh, regarding the bill. We're going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to ask, given our time constraints and the committee coming in behind us to limit your comments to about two minutes, uh, we'll start with Ms. Sarah Matz, uh, followed by uh, Heather Mayfield. Uh, just right there will be fine, right there on the – yeah. Well, oh, there will be fine just at that mic. Yeah, please, two minutes. What's that mic number? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Meeks and uh, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Matz. I'm the Government Relations Director for the Southern Region of the Computing Technology Industry Association, or CompTIA. CompTIA's Southern Region plays an active role in national tech growth, particularly in Georgia. As background, CompTIA is a global tech industry trade association representing over 2,000 member companies of all sizes, including companies in the telecom, software, hardware, and system integration verticals. We operate an extensive advocacy and public policy practice that touches all 50 states. And I just want to say up front that we 100% support the ability of consumers to freely and safely repair their electronic devices. In fact, there are currently many different choices available to consumers to repair their own device, either by a professional or through their own efforts. But that's not really what the point of this bill is about. This legislation is about picking winners and losers in the state and it would mandate the disclosure of proprietary information, access to diagnostic and repair documentation, updates to software, and original equipment manufacturer parts for a predetermined cost to anyone who requests it. While this may seem fair to some, dictating how a company operates when it comes to use and access to intellectual property is in fact anything but fair. Of particular, uh, excuse me, of particular concern with this bill is the potential to weaken the security features in a host of different electronic devices. To be clear, this bill isn't about a broken screen on a phone or a dead battery, and it certainly isn't just about fixing the carburetor on a tractor. As specified in the bill, manufacturers of any product that connects to an embedded software on which it operates will be subject to the information disclosure requirements to any party requesting it. This includes servers that host critical infrastructure, including servers like the ones utilized by the state of Georgia and security systems that are designed to keep us safe. The security of user information on these products is of the utmost importance to manufacturers and consumers that use them. Most electronics are highly integrated products, only intended to be dismantled, dismantled by properly trained professionals. Improper handling of high-risk components or alterations threaten consumer safety and may lead to serious injuries. And I have more, but I realize that my time is, <laughs> is um, but giving up uh, sensitive and protected intellectual property is a problem. HB 286 requires the copyright holder to provide copyrighted work to the service provided carte blanche. This bill brings much gray area to intellectual property law, and it doesn't sufficiently address the terms, consequences, and rights or relationships of ownership that the ownership transfer would create. And um, I'll move forward. Um, quickly. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, th I think the most important part is that, uh, besides this, the safety and security concerns that we have, is that the legislation really does pit small businesses against each other, and it creates a winners and losers scenario uh, within the state. We understand that independent repair shops want access to this information from manufacturer supply chain to help their own businesses, but this legislation could invalidate the contracts and investments and employment and the hard work of authorized repair shops that are already here in Georgia and across the country. Um, so thank you again uh, for allowing me to be here today and, um, and sharing my opinion. I'm happy to address any concerns. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you started off uh, with just a quick question saying that you support the idea of property owners being able to repair or have things repaired. Do you have an, any alternate legislation that would allow that that's different than this that you could present yet? Well, I think as uh, Representative Turner pointed out, it's not needed. Uh, people already have the ability to fix their device. Um, as he mentioned himself um, with his wife uh, wanting right. fixing his So, so you dryer. want to only do it for some things, not all the things he's talking about. Well, no, but I'm saying that a law doesn't need to be uh, to be passed to, to pick winners and losers. He mentioned, he told a story about his wife going online and buying a part for the dryer and figuring out how to fix it herself. Anybody can do that today. Anybody can do that with their own devices. This bill doesn't change that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tanner. Turner, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out that the example I used about my wife was specifically about safety <laughs> and uh, only because my, this particular manufacturer doesn't have a passcode or a lock code was that mm -hmm. possible. And so one of the things that you said is simply isn't true is that uh, carte blanche allows people to have access to uh, proprietary information. Isn't it true that if you give me access, if, you, if, if I purchase a piece of digital equipment that and I have the uh, the wherewithal, the technical savvy that I can access any source code I want. That you have the wherewithal. I mean, if if savvy? I had the if I was technically savvy, if mm -hmm. I purchased anything that had a digital, that had firmware loaded on mm -hmm. it, that ran on, I would be able to uh, access that source code and make changes to it uh, uh, today without this bill. No, but you can certainly reach out to an independent repair shop or an authorized repair shop or the authorized equipment manufacturer. See, that's, that's simply technically not true. Uh, this is one of the things when we get into uh, to the members of the committee that I think is, is very valuable to know. Uh, if you have technical savvy, you could go over across the hall into the lieutenant governor's office and ask Mike Dudgeon this because this is kind of his background. You can, if, once you purchase something that has digital firmware on it, it's only a, you can you can access that firmware if you have technical skills to do so. Um, there is nothing in the law that prevents you from doing that. There's nothing in the law that prevents you from making changes to that firmware for your own personal use. A copyright law protects the individual from doing that. The, pro the copyright law also protects the original equipment manufacturer in the event that um, uh, somebody does make those changes from selling them. Uh, so you can't profit from it, but you're allowed to make changes all you want to. Uh, this, this bill does not give carte blanche access to IP. It basically says if you sell it to somebody uh, that you get to set the terms as the manufacturer for what the, the, the person who's purchasing it would like to buy it from you. Uh, it's not predetermined other than by the equipment manufacturer. And so I, I, would, I would take exception to the, that particular uh, line of questioning. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, Heather? Followed by Lisa McCabe. And if you don't mind, we're oh, um, wait one. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, we have Quick. some people here to answer questions to as well. Okay, so. quickly, two minutes, please. Okay, uh, good afternoon, Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Heather Maxfield. I'm with Technology Association of Georgia. We represent 35,000 different members across the state, um, all leading in communications technology, retail, and media companies. Uh, respectfully and uh, respectfully to the sponsor of this bill, we urge you to oppose HB 286. The bill as it's written, which has been seen in other states and not passed, would threaten consumer safety and security and mandate the disclosure of protected proprietary uh, information. Furthermore, the bill is unnecessary because consumers already can choose who repairs their s devices. Customer safety, security, privacy are fundamental goals 
in the design of members' hardware, software, and services. Smartphones, computers, computer servers, and other devices are at risk on a daily basis of hacking and weakening of the security protections of those devices, such as sharing sensitive diagnostic tools that can be misused for hacking, will certainly increase the risk for the consumer. Proper repair is extremely detailed and complicated. Manufacturers want to ensure that their products are serviced by professionals who understand the intricacies of their products and have been through a substantial amount of time and training, procuring the knowledge to safely repair the device and return it to the consumer without compromising standards or consumer safety. And I'll stop there to say, you know, one of the things that Representative Turner mentioned is that he, he wants it to be a fair and reasonable um, to maintain, diagnose, and repair equipment. I would say if that be the case, then wouldn't it be fair for those repair companies that are interested in getting into the business to become an authorized repair shop? That would make it more of an, an equal playing field, if you will. Okay. Um, and I would also say, too, that respectfully, you know, just because you can fix something doesn't make it safe, right? Um, I have a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate the uh, the time constraint. Yeah. Obviously, we're, we've got a, a list of folks here, a lot to be heard, and we will try to try to get through this as quick as possible. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. We're going to hold questions if we might to the end, and then any of the members has questions, we'll we'll get those out uh, while everyone is still here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. And we have um, the letters that we. Can Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa McCabe, and I'm with CPIA, the Trade Association for the Wireless Communications Industry. So our um, members include wireless service providers, infrastructure suppliers, um, infrastructure providers, suppliers, and um, original uh, equipment manufacturers. Um, we are uh, concerned with the unintended consequences that this bill may raise, which um, have been um, mentioned by a number of my colleagues. And I um, also want to, want to stress, which has been mentioned by my, um, my colleagues here, that uh, equipment manufacturers do have authorized repair. These are people who have gone through training and um, know the intricacies of every one of these um, a number of devices, ma every manufacturer has their own criteria for their um, authorized repair. And by passing a bill like this, you're going to weaken this relationship that is actually put in place by contract so that consumers can be um, protected and the quality of the brand that the, whatever the thing is, whether it's a washing machine or a, um, any other type of electronic d device, their brand is very important and it wants to be protected. So you protect that brand by having authorized people who know what they're doing, who have the special training to fix it properly so that it has, it, ha it performs the way it's expected to from the first owner to the last owner. So by choosing to provide information to anyone who asks, you're then weakening the relationship of the, of, um, the brand awareness, uh, the brand um, of the of the product itself, as well as um, harming those who have gone through the process to become authorized repair. And as we move into a world of um, of the Internet of Things, it does become important. So security becomes very important. And one of the things that our association has done for um, Internet of Things devices, we have a certification so that uh, anything that's going onto the device onto the networks is certified so that we know it's going to um, protect security. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Joe Holler. I'm here on behalf of the Security Industry Association. We represent about a thousand companies that manufacture and integrate physical security equipment. So from a product category that ranges from video surveillance cameras, access control portals, um, alarm systems, facial recognition, drones, counter drones, you name it. Um, I'm here to oppose uh, the bill before us today since due to the broad definition of digital electronic equipment, it would impact our members adversely. And I'd like to echo some of the previous statements that deal with you know how most of our manufacturers prefer going through the authorized uh, repair channels given the fact that they 
ensure those employees go through rigorous trainings. And I think another point that's understated is most of these authorized repair shops are small business owners. And when they get into a contractual agreement with the manufacturer, that is a steady, constant res uh, revenue stream that they enjoy on a yearly or however long the, count the contract uh, stipulates. And even sometimes they'll get a licensing deal out of it. Um, and then another thing that I would like to you know, kind of raise that I think is not really mentioned in this discussion is the impact on encryption. Uh, given the fact that, again, we talk about firmware embedded software, um, most of our members will like to encrypt that level of software to ensure you know, higher cybersecurity standards. And this bill could be construed to force OEMs to divulge that sensitive encryption information. And if that information is publicly available and placed into malicious hands, it could compromise networks and even video surveillance cameras like we see you up there. Um, so th again, that's all I have for you all today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks Thank again you. for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Jeanette, followed by Alex Bradford. I'm the director of Environment Georgia, uh, which is a citizen-based environmental organization that works to protect Georgia's air, water, and green spaces. Um, and we are here to support Georgia's right to repair law. We can and we should reduce waste by making it easier to repair our stuff. So there are a few quick facts that I was going to share. One, electronic waste or e-waste is the fastest growing waste stream. Um, uh, approximately 416,000 mobile phones were thrown out each day in this country, and if you break that down per capita, that means that Georgia throws away 12,000 cell phones every single day. Um, E-waste contains toxic materials. It's estimated that 40% of the heavy metals in the U.S. Um, come from discarded electronics. Um, and unfortunately, that e-waste is very hard to recycle. So only 12.5% of the e-waste that we produce is actually recycled. Um, and by far, the largest environmental impact of electronics um, is actually manufacturing them. It takes a lot more energy to manufacture electronics than you do to actually run the run the electronics. So um, it's estimated that 81% of a desktop computer's energy use is in making it, um, only 19% in using it. So by far the easiest way to address this problem uh, is to make sure that we continue to use our products. Um, and the best way to do that is to remove barriers to repair. So a lot of the opposition arguments that you're hearing today boil down to the idea that we can't be trusted to fix our own stuff um, or hire a technician of our choice, that it's too risky um, and dangerous if we had the freedom to choose. But uh, the loss of that freedom means that only the companies who sell our products can decide what to fix and what to charge, and the result is we are left with a growing environmental burden to be passed on to local budgets, um, local economies, and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. Alex? My name is Alex Bradford. I represent Georgia Farm Bureau and our, and our roughly 280,000 members across all the counties of the state. Uh, we are the largest general farm organization in the state, and my work up here is to advocate for the policy positions that originate from our members and is voted on annually. Um, I appreciate you all hearing this today. My hopes that this will help facilitate and further the conversation on the proposed policy. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the the ag equipment side and farmers perspective by no means am I an expert on computer coding or intellectual property uh, law but from a practical standpoint we believe that uh, farmers and private property farm equipment mechanics have the right to access technology and diagnose and repair all farm equipment um, this has arisen over the past 10 years as manufacturers have had to comply with increased federal regulation um, and unfortunately, implementing technology and computer systems to abide by those increased regulations have limited and stifled the ability of farmers to work on their equipment as they traditionally have. Um, under the current environment, relying solely on a dealer authorized tech creates not only an op creates the only option for farmers to buy dealer price parts and labor and work on uh, technician schedules. 
by allowing third-party parts and repair. It would increase competition of parts and local mechanics to help farmers choose options based on their capabilities, reduce downtime at critical planting and harvesting, uh, and help save money. Um, by allowing third parties these tools, information, and schematics necessary to diagnose and maintain uh, repair equipment um, and access the necessary system codes to reboot and diagnose the equipment, it'll help keep farms running while also supporting lo local tech school graduates who the General Assembly and the Rural Development Council has placed such an emphasis on training for modern day jobs in our rural communities. Uh, from a policy perspective, Farm Bureau supports the needs of our farmers to work on this equipment. Uh, and this is a private property rights at its broadest perspective uh, because you can't really own something if you don't have access to all the equipment. Um, I do think that discussions like this are needed to, to help protect both the private property of those uh, purchasers and the intellectual property of the manufacturer. And I think co conversations like this are important to have, but uh, we support the underlying policy moving forward. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Aaron, did I get that right? Followed by Nate Miner. Hello, my name is Aaron Swedberg. I'm an independent repair shop. We repair primarily Apple products, tablets, MacBook computers, iPhones. Um, I'm here to support that bill. Um, I want to start off by saying everything that you guys heard about the authorized and certified technicians, I am dual certified through Apple as a repair technician. Apple will not send me out any OEM parts. They will not give me access to any schematic diagrams. And they have set a um, batorium where they are not allowing any other authorized service centers to be opened. Um, there is tons of e-waste that is produced every single day by people throwing out their cell phones, their old computers. Um, excuse me. Um, the first thing that we learned in Apple certification class is Apple does not want you to fix your um, equipment. They do not want you to upgrade your existing equipment. They want you to buy new equipment. I feel like all the opposition behind this bill is just these manufacturers trying to get more money and create a monopoly. And I will let Nate take over from here. Thank you, fellas. Nate. Thank you, Chairman. Um, my name is Nate Miner, and I own ScreenFixing.com, a repair company uh, based in the city of Atlanta. We focused on high-end resolution on phones, tablets, laptops, and other electronics. We have four employees who are well-paid, have access to health, vision, and dental benefits. I'm here today to ask you to support the right to repair HB 286. In the past few years, we've retrieved thousands of photos, notes, vo voicemails, contacts from customer devices. In order to do this, we have to use materials currently that have fallen off the back of a truck <coughs> to diagnose issues. When those materials are not available, it increases the complexity significantly to perform any recovery. We aren't asking to build our own phones. We aren't a manufacturer. We aren't asking to bypass security features. We're not hackers. And hackers would not find the information we're looking for relevant. We simply want to have access to diagnostics, maintenance, and service information that will help us do our job. You may ask, why not become an authorized service provider? Well, Aaron cleared up some of that. Uh, we can't. We went to the website on Apple's website to say, hey, I would like to become an Apple service uh, provider, and the page didn't go anywhere. It was a 404 error. Uh, so, <coughs> unfortunately, after uh, realizing we couldn't be and looking into it, we realized that authorized repair shops aren't actually able to perform most of the repairs that we would prefer perform in store. So if your charge port in your phone or something like that uh, goes out, Apple will tell you new phone, we will tell you cheap repair, and you're out in 30 minutes. Uh, I ask you to support HP 286 and support third-party repair. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Todd Bone, followed by Misty Holcomb. A little handout. <coughs> I'm uh, Todd Bone. Can you hear me? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so I'm president and uh, founder of Exus International in Alpharetta, Georgia. I'm also on the board of the Service Industry Association, representing 100 maintenance and repair companies in the enterprise, uh, more like data center equipment space. And also chairman of the board of ASCDI, 
which is a global organization um, supporting also the resale of products and, uh, and, and, and servicing. So um, my company is a federal contractor. We actually um, support the supercomputers that uh, run our missile defense program. They're 24-year-old computers, and I find it quite interesting that I'm allowed to do that through a federal prime contractor for the Air Force, yet I can't maintain two- or three-year-old computers because the manufacturer will not give the customers access to updates outside of a maintenance contract. And I thought that was, um, I thought that was tying, which is an antitrust uh, um, violation. Um, so our industry is full of companies up to about 600 million in revenue. We've got 50 companies in our associations here in Georgia, the largest of which is 600 million in revenue. So we're, we are employing a lot of people. Um, we've done some research uh, with those association members who all think that they're they would be able to hire more Americans if this bill passes. A couple other things I wanted to talk about was um, kind of dispelling a couple things. I agree that I'm, I'm also an authorized reseller for a couple of different manufacturers. We can't be authorized with Cisco because we sell independent maintenance, so they don't allow a company to do both. And I also do maintenance on the back end for a couple of very, very well-known server manufacturers. So they're actually coming to us. As a matter of fact, you probably don't realize this, that, that most manufacturers don't do their own support. They don't have their own W-2 engineers in the field. Those are all outsourced. They come to companies like me to do back-end support. And IBM, Dell, and HP all do third-party maintenance. Matter of fact, HPE just outsourced all of their maintenance to Unisys Corporation. So I think you're hearing a lot of, I'm, I'm very disappointed, and especially CompTIA, TAG, and CTIA. All my engineers are certified by the manufacturers. We are ISO compliant. We've been a federal contractor for 27 years. I'm selling to the DOD. Thank you, Todd. So, thank you. Misty, followed by Gay. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Misty Holcomb. I'm here today on behalf of the Entertainment Software Association. Um, the ESA is the national uh, association that represents the companies who publish computer and video games. And in the interest of time, i uh, just like to echo the sentiments offered by CompTIA and TAG. Um, we're also signed on to one of the, the letters that they provided to you. Um, and that just we have concerns about unintended consequences to the, the console's security measures if this bill passed. So we'd ask you to oppose it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> Followed by Mr. Woodall will be next. Yeah. Um, hello, members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I wanted to make sure you understood there's some very sound legal principles that went into the drafting of this bill uh, that nobody has talked about yet. And I think it's very important to understand that the first problem we are looking at is actually an antitrust problem. Um, manufacturers do not have the right to demand that you require ma that you buy maintenance from them. It's called an illegal tying agreement. But the reason that we can't go through the U.S. Department of Justice is that the nature of these monopolies is no longer physical. Um, they're used to dealing with monopolies on production, not monopolies on ideas. And we've met with them, and they're not going to pursue it. It's got to be done by the states. We would like not to have to be here. Um, the first sale document, the first sale doctrine, also supports the fact that manufacturers have no rights to control what you do beyond the purchase. When you buy something, it's yours. They cannot tell you what to do with it, although they do. They cannot tell you how to repair it, although they do. And they cannot um, prevent you from reselling it in an open market. And they do that as well. And the way that they do that is through the end user license agreement, which is that little click to accept, little thing that you don't ever want to read. Well, if you read it, you're going to discover all sorts of really horrible stuff. And the reason you don't get to see it up front is they don't want you to know all that really horrible stuff. If you click on one of those agreements, you have given up essentially all of your rights. Because it doesn't, there's no purpose for an end user license agreement on the surface. You will already have a license uh, for any software that you license. It's a separate and, and optional agreement. You get Microsoft Office, 
you that's a choice you make and so you abide by the terms of that license but when you have an implied or hidden or referenced license the contract no longer matches what you thought you bought you've given up your rights in that end user license agreement which is why it's appropriate for state legislatures to attack this through unfair and deceptive trade practices which is the reference on the bill um, other than that everything is completely legal under copyright law and patent law and trade secret law there is nothing that is being requested in this bill that is not already legally available mm -hmm. under copyright law if there are limitations they exist and they don't go away with this bill so uh, the entertainment software group is um, trying to infer that there's some connection to repair, which there is not. Uh, their games, their media is all unrelated to repair. Thank you. And I, I'll be available for more questions. Thank you. Mr. Gadsden Woodall, followed by Cosby. <coughs> Thanks, Mr. sir. Chair, Go ahead. Thank you for your time. <coughs> My name is Gadsden Woodall, uh, and I'm the owner of MrFixit.com. Uh, we have four repair shops in Georgia. Um, we started out of Valdosta, and we have 15 employees. Um, our organization has repaired over 45,000 devices, uh, ranging from cell phones, computers, uh, laptops, to tablets, uh, to toothbrushes and hearing aids. Um, there is no specific terms uh, that that we're asking for as far as repair, it is general. We need access to manuals to, uh, even if it's a certification, we need access to be certified. Like Nate said, that we do not have the ability to become certified through Apple, this is true. We have tried as well. Um, the only places that are, are strictly Apple. They are basically Apple stores. So if Apple is the only one who can be Apple, then there, there is no certification process for us. One of our nightmares came true uh, in iOS 11 um, back a few years ago. We had, when an update came out, we had, I mean, I, I, I don't even ha know how many phone calls that we had that day, but people were saying that they woke up, their phone was updated, and now they can't touch their screen. And these were customers of ours. So we had, I mean, we were scrambling. We were calling the manufacturers, what's wrong with your screens, you know, and come to find out it was the update. The update disabled our ability to repair the device uh, by disabling the screen that we put on there and sent out in the update that it could affect all third-party repairs. So I don't know if it's malicious. Um, it seems, you know, like they're targeting us. <laughs> in some way, but if there's a certification process that we could follow, 100% uh, accepted to that. Um, we just want to be able to have access to diagnostic tools and uh, repair manuals um, so that we can provide repair in South Georgia, where an Apple store is an hour and a half away. Okay, thank you. So, yes, sir. Thank you. thank you for the latitude, Mr. Chairman. I want to add just to that. This is, this is something that, that the manufacturer did after the uh, the consumer purchased that phone they they made that change afterwards so they bought one thing they updated their software and it uh it under changed you know you you're constantly having to update your 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 phone and your ios but in this particular case that phone when they purchased it was perfectly okay to do this and the manufacturer changed things to make it disabled and that's one of the things we're trying to fix in this bill thank you Mr. Cosby. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your time and thank the committee members for their time. I know it's been a long day. Um, my name is Cosby Johnson with the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, who is the statewide uh, business advocacy group. Um, we uh, have had conversations with Representative Turner and we know that this bill doesn't come in any way with ill intent. However, we do uh, disagree and oppose with the bill as we think the language is uh, far too outreaching as um, Chairman Watson said fixing a cell phone is a lot different than fixing farm equipment and we believe those discussions need to be had in the free market between businesses and those who who buy that material those materials from them um, many in many cases as with automobiles and in 2021 when farm 
equipment will be fully uh, updated. Many of those uh, free market conversations have happened and those things have opened up and we would like to leave that in the hands of the businesses and those who, who buy those uh, manufacturing pieces of manufacturing equipment from them. So um, we would ask for your um, opposition to the bill as we don't agree with it and we thank you for your time. Thank you, Cosby. Scott, and followed by Mr. Roy Bowen. Hi, I'm Scott Jones. Um, I'm here to represent Electronic Frontiers Georgia. Our, our mission is protecting and promoting online civil liberties. And uh, also, personally, I am a, a, a system administrator and have been a software developer with a 30-year career in technology. And we are warmly supportive of the bill and, and very enthusiastic about it. Um, and I thank you, especially Representative Turner, for, for pushing this issue forward. Uh, I mean, as a, as a quick story, it, uh, I, was always uh, I was always interested in technology as a boy. At age five or six, I took apart my uh, grandmother's reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and, and sadly broke it. And then it, uh, about three years later, uh, age nine, I was smart enough to fix it. Uh, and then at age 10, uh, I wrote my first line of, of software code in, in a language known as COBOL. And it, uh, that curiosity and, and many other stories like that uh, shows how um, my curiosity at a young age launched a, a career. And I would like to say that this right to repair is more than just a right to repair. It's also a right to break and a right to learn. And as the state is trying to figure out how to uh, increase and enhance uh, STEM education and, and STEAM education, especially with women and minorities, this is one of the most cost-effective ways that you could possibly do that. Not all learning about technology occurs in a formal setting. Uh, the right to uh, repair is also the right to, to open something up and learn, you know, basically how it works. You may break it in the process. Perhaps we need an amendment regarding liability in that case. Uh, but aside from that, I'm warmly supportive of that, and, and I'm really delighted to see this. Uh, I also have connections uh, through the Electronic Frontier Alliance, through Electronic Frontier Foundation. If for any reason this bill does not uh, pass through, uh, we would like to continue, uh, we would like to help uh, continue to support this. And if you need some model legislation, if this does not work, um, then we would like to, to help uh, and continue the effort to find something that does. So thank I, thank for I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time as well. Mr. Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Roy Bowen. I'm president of the Georgia Association of Manufacturers. And I thank you for the opportunity to express concerns about House Bill 286, the Right to Repair Act, uh, from the perspective of the ag and construction non-road equipment manufacturers and the authorized dealers. Uh, you know, Georgia can boast millions of dollars of investment by companies such as John Deere, JCB, Agco, Caterpillar, Yanmar, and Kubota <coughs> that manufacture non-road construction and agriculture machinery and equipment. And these manufacturers and authorized dealers uh, also that, that sell that sell the uh, uh, products employ thousands of highly trained Georgians across the state. First, I'd like to let you know, really emphasize, reemphasize that manufacturers and dealers of ag and non-road construction equipment uh, do make available to owners of their products and to independent service providers service manuals, product guides, and other public publications with information on service, parts operation, and safety, and parts. And they provide product service demonstrations, fleet management information, onboard diagnostic via in-cab display or telematics interface, and other support. And using this information in these tools, which are available for purchase or lease or subscription, owners are able to identify and repair numerous malfunctions that they may encounter with their equipment. House Bill 286 would mandate that manufacturers go well beyond reasonable bounds to provide access to sophisticated diagnostic equipment for digital electronic equipment, including source codes and unlocking proprietary embedded software or code. And this obligation to provide or make available these diagnostic tools would impose on manufacturers a requirement to provide them to untrained technicians without training or knowledge for proper use. And this lack, lack of knowledge and improper utilization will result in mistakes and damage which could lead to operator injury or product damage and could void warranty coverage. You know, contrary to Representative Turner's assertion that this just covers maintenance, diagnosing, and repair, 
Uh, this bill's requirements would also enable owners and independent service providers to modify the product outside of product operations verifications, thereby undermining product integrity and creating safety concerns and operator injury, and modify the product uh, to affect emissions outside of the specifications and federally mandated requirements. So I'm a little puzzled why Environmental Georgia ignores this environmental potential. You know, by so doing, this, really, this bill should really be called the Right to Modify Act. And the ability to modify and, uh, and to jeopardize intellectual and proprietary, proprietary property rights is at the heart of our opposition. We believe that this is unnecessary and ill-advised legislation and urge that it be defeated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you who have uh, uh, cooperated with us on the timely manner of trying to get everyone an opportunity to speak. Uh, we're going to be at, we have to be out of here in probably five, maybe six, seven minutes. So we're going to take a few minutes for the committee members to uh, ask questions. And uh, at this point, Mr. Perkle, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the author. Um, a few years ago, I was, uh, I don't know, the, so um, technology has encompassed virtually all of our lives now with the, the phones and the tractors and the vehicles and the, um, one of the things that just struck me is um, several years ago, I was driving my tractor on the back side of the Beard Place and um, I, was, I was here in land and it just quit. It just stopped. Um, and I looked for the obvious signs of, am I out of diesel? No. Am I out of, is it, is it, was it seizing before? No. Did you try turning it off and back on again? Did, but it would not cut back on, on. It was just, it was just there. And it turns out there's a switch in the seat. There's a switch in the seat that went off. And uh, it quit. And so I went and I got me another switch and I, I replaced it and changed it out. And, um, it may or may not have been a switch um, manufactured by the manufacturer of the of the tractor. Um, and and here here lies my concern. I've got a thousand dollar phone right here that within three days of purchasing I I dropped, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and um, I can't go to my buddy in Valdosta to get it fixed because apparently. Um, um, my concern going forward is um, if I purchase this equipment and um, looking out, if I have a, a fix, if I have a, a repair that needs to be done, and it's working just fine, and then when there's an update to, a com to the system, all of a sudden this thing that was working no longer works. Now, you know, that's one thing with my cell phone. Um, uh, but where else will that occur? And that is my main concern. I'm, you know, I know about the, the warranty stuff, and I want to make sure that we are covered, we're safe. Um, but um, how does your bill impact um, these various categories without unduly burdening the manufacturer who still wants to sell me these things? I mean, I paid a thousand dollars for this thing. Uh, they still want to sell me these things, but I'm going to drop them. Um, tell me about your bill, how that um, will help me or not help me. If we can do that quickly, again, we have another committee coming in behind us. I know we want to get a couple more comments in. So, thank you. Um, under this bill, you would have a right to gain access to the, the, the manuals, documentation, you'd have a, you, or to take it to a repair person of your choosing that would have access to that documentation and the expertise because they, they read up on the manuals or they, they, uh, they tried to go through the training. Uh, they, they would have the diagnostic tools if there are any tools. How about if they screw it up? If they screw it up, that's on them. I mean that's that's on you. I mean if you if that there's no there's no liability for the manufacturer. Is that language in here? That they need to refuse? No, there's that's copyright law. That's already established. We don't touch that. So the the you know the that's how it would impact you. Your community is going to have 
a whole bunch of new entrepreneurs pop up and meet that need for you. They're going to have high-tech, well-paying jobs that allow them to work with their hands in a different way than farming, but they're going to be able to support your farming community. And that's how it's really going to impact you and your community. Um, the, I just want to address one quick point, and I'll, I'll, I'll call it a day, Mr. Chairman, uh, the right to modify com uh, uh, comment. You have a right to modify now. This doesn't change that. If you have access, there's nothing in this bill that changes the fact that a tech-savvy person can go into code and modify it to violate the law in some other way. There's nothing in this bill that changes that, that fact. If somebody had tech savvy or at skills and they're able to modify code, they could do that today. They just need to get access to that code, decompile it, make changes, and then upload it again. That's, that is a complicated skill set. Not everybody's going to have it, but they could do that. This bill doesn't give anybody special access that way. We're talking about diagnostic, maintenance, and repair. Anything else is, is a red herring. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate you sitting through with and explaining this very technical issue, and I hope to be able to, have to do it again with you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kirby, quickly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real quick, uh, I think we all would like to find something that consumers can choose to, to repair their devices. Um, we hear that, but we also heard OEMs don't give them the information. We also know, and we talk about manufacturers cannot tell you what to do, but, yeah, they do. Think about it this way. In our society today, everybody's quick to sue, and especially somebody with deep pockets is going to be named, and they name everybody. So we, we've got to find a balance. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I certainly would like all the people in the parties involved come back with something that does allow the people to choose and kind of answer some of these questions we need to balance out. Thank you, sir. Chairman Watson. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we've had a lot of testimony here, and it sounds like everybody's doing pretty good. They're making a lot of money, repairing, getting things done. Um, no other no other states have done this before. Uh, I'm confused why we're here. I've never had a problem with access with equipment on, on my farm, and, and um, we, we get things done. I'm just worried about the liabilities issues here, safety issues here, and I think it needs a lot more conversation before we go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the participants, to the committee, thank you for your participation uh, today. At this point, I'll entertain a motion. Move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you for attendance today.